This video is sponsored by Incogni. In a world so loud and overwhelming, it can feel like a sink or swim reality. And while most of us learn to float, some find it easier to sink into obscurity. Both isolation and solitude can be a shelter from a society that, at times, feels all too difficult to cope with. And in Japan, those who take this path are known as hikikomori. But what happens when one of these types of people snaps? When they do snap, how many people will fall victim to their horrendous actions? And how did a horrific event in Kawasaki in May of 2019 trigger a second tragedy only days later? Good morning, good afternoon, or good evening, folks. My name is Adrian, and welcome or welcome back to Coffeehouse Crime. Now, in this video, we're looking at not one, but two cases today. Now, allow me to elaborate why here, but in this video we're looking at a murder case which would then spur and cause another murder case just a few days later. Anyway, before we begin, and just to let you know, that I post true crime and strange cases here weekly, so if that does sound like your kind of thing, please consider subscribing to the channel. And now, with that said, please grab yourself a coffee, pull up a seat, and get ready for the deep dive. This is the case of the Hikikomori murders. Gozimas, folks. Today, we are visiting one of Coffeehouse Crime's most frequented countries. And of course, that's the beautiful East Asian nation of Japan. Now, I've said plenty about Japan before. Although it's a relatively small island, it's a complex country with a fascinating culture. And it's hard not to get lost in your own curiosity here. Every corner seems to have something to see, do, or eat here and Japan is often said to be an adult's playground. From the busy streets of Tokyo, with its roadside ramen bars, intimate izakaya, and tucked away temples, right through to their soothing countryside hot springs, Japan is a place like no other. Japan tends to be well associated with futuristic and modern inventions, such as robots, bullet trains, video games, and of course, anime and manga. And in fact, if you walk around the streets of Tokyo, you'd be hard done by not to spot some kind of anime or manga character or even just a cute little mascot within your view. From their train networks hosting them all over their carriages, to convenience stores and even airports having their own mascots and media sponsors, the nation of Japan is engrossed in fictional characters and their own little worlds. Anime and manga in particular have made their mark across the world all over, gripping the interests of people both young and old. However, and this tends to be one of my most favourite sayings, but everything in moderation, right? People can sometimes get a little too engrossed in fiction, some even neglecting their real lives in favour of the imaginary world. And those that do this can simultaneously try to escape existence in society. Of course, you have probably guessed what I'm talking about here, and that is the world of hikikomori. But what are hikikomori exactly? And why is being one seen as such a negative label in Japanese society? Simply put, hikikomori are categorised as so called shut-ins, people who rarely leave the house and despise interacting with others. In the Western world, you could probably call them hermits, extreme introverts, or agoraphobes, people with a genuine fear of going outside and being in public spaces. Hikikomori can also be seen as a NEAT, that's N-double-E-T, which stands for not an education, employment, or training. So basically, that's someone who doesn't contribute to society in any distinct or useful way. These social shut-ins are often looked at negatively by wider society, especially in a country like Japan, where there is a strong sense of honour that comes from working and supporting yourself, your family, and the wider economy. Speaking of the internet, the more time that you spend online, the more likely that someone somewhere has your details. And that's why I'd like to talk about today's sponsor, Incogni. Every time you sign up to a website, you are likely expected to accept the terms of service, that long list of jargon that no one ever tends to read. But when was the last time you thoroughly reviewed one of those? By accepting their terms of service, you may have given your consent for your data to be sold and resold by hundreds of data brokers. This includes personal information such as your name, gender, location, and even your address. Now, this could lead to your inbox being flooded with spam emails. Companies creating accounts of you, or, in the worst of hands, someone stealing your identity. And this is where Incogni comes in. Incogni protects you online, by removing your personal data from the market. They reach out to data brokers on your behalf, and request all your data to be removed. They will even handle any obligations for you. Personally, Incogni has already removed 40 threats identified with my email address and still actively searches to remove more. Simply sign up using my unique code, CRIME, create an account, grant them the right to work for you, and the automated system will do the rest. 
You are also able to see the type of data broker, what information they carry, and their risk factor. Protect your online privacy today. Incogni's offering 60% off to the first 100 people who use my unique code, CRIME. For any of you who are interested, I'll leave that in the pinned comment and description down below. Thank you to Incogni for sponsoring today's video, thank you to you folks for supporting us content creators, and now let's get straight back to today's case. And amongst these recluses of society, in the city of Kawasaki, just south of Tokyo, we find 51-year-old Ryuichi Iwasaki. Ryuichi was born in December 1967, and despite his parents being together at the time of his birth, this wouldn't last for long. They divorced when he was only four years old, and as a result, he went to go and live solely with his father, rarely seeing his mother. However, this situation would not be stable either, and Ryuichi would eventually move in with his extended family in a crowded house consisting of his grandparents, aunt, uncle, and cousins. During his childhood, he was enrolled in Caritas Elementary School before graduating to junior high, and eventually progressed to a vocational training school where he studied engineering. Ryuichi led a relatively normal life, though he did struggle to maintain friendships during his school years. He was otherwise stress-free, and following his graduation, he worked in several basic jobs, mainly factory work and as a night guard for a local store. But throughout the years, and while his cousins moved out and got on with their own lives, Ryuichi he continued to live in the family home. His grandparents sadly passed away in 1990, thus leaving him with just his aunt and his uncle. As Ryuichi moved into his 40s, he found himself spending more and more time at home alone, which, as you can imagine, may sometimes result in depression. But the lack of comfort didn't end there sadly. He had also recently lost his job, and with no rent or mortgage to pay, he made no effort to find re-employment. Although Ryuichi's aunt and uncle were often out of the house, doing their own things, such as work and their own hobbies, they still did their best to look after to him. I mean, they practically babysat him. His meals were cooked, his clothes were washed, and the bills were always paid. However, despite this, he always did his best to avoid going outside. As the years passed by, so did their birthdays. The couple were slowly growing old, and with all of the love and support they gave their nephew, they hoped that, one day, he would return the favour. However, as they would eventually find out, Ryuichi was becoming very selfish in his 40s, and by the year 2010, he'd abandoned all efforts of becoming a functioning member of society. Instead, he spent every waking moment in his own room, playing video games and watching manga while trying to avoid any contact with the outside world. And sadly, this included his own family. Despite their nephew's presence, the aging couple were so desperate for care that they eventually asked the local welfare centre for home care visits. However, due to Ryuichi living at the property, they were instead advised to speak to him for help. Soon after this, they asked him to do his own housework, and in the month of January 2019, they left a note outside of his bedroom door, the note explaining their dilemma and begging him for his help. However, Ryuichi didn't take their message very well. Instead, he confronted them, saying, I do my own meals, laundry, and other things myself. What do you mean I'm withdrawn? The now 51-year-old Ryuichi had become entirely comfortable in his unemployed and secluded life, and having been in this situation for decades now, he had gained a strong sense of entitlement to his easy lifestyle. Neighbours would also complain about his behaviour. One notable instance occurred in the summer of 2018, when the neighbour's tree branch was slightly hanging over the adjoining fence. After realising this, Ryuichi furiously knocked on their door, insulting them and commencing an hour-long argument. By now, it was obvious that he had become semi-feral and furious with the world. He despised his uncle and aunt for making him feel useless, even though, deep down, he knew that he actually was. The man no longer fit in with society. However, very little did anyone know that this sentiment would manifest itself in one of the most terrible of ways. May the 28th, 2019. At roughly 7am that morning, Ryuichi did something entirely out of the ordinary. He got up early and left the house for the first time in several weeks. Stranger still, he wished his neighbours a good day on the way out. Meanwhile, a short train ride away, things were typical for a morning at Noborito Station. Commuters were busily making their way to work, while local children were heading off to school. It is not unusual for even young children to travel to school alone. Alongside Norway and Switzerland, it has one of the lowest crime rates per capita. And I know what some of you are going to say, yes, that's at least what they record. At 7.44am on this day, a crowd of people, mainly children, 
were waiting for their shuttle buses to arrive, one of which was a bus to Karita's elementary school, the very same school that Ryuichi had studied many years previously. Speaking of Ryuichi, it was in this moment that he arrived. However, he was not there to get in line for a bus. Brandishing a knife from his jacket, Ryuichi began his attack at the back of the waiting line, and after attacking a male adult, he ran towards the crowd of children and parents. He proceeded by lacerating a mother, before cruelly turning the knife on the youngest of the bunch. And as a bus unexpectedly pulled up to the commotion, its driver looked on in shock and horror, unable to comprehend what he was witnessing. But Ryuichi's spree ended almost as soon as it began, because as the crowd frantically dispersed, Ryuichi walked 10 meters before then turning the knife on himself an action that ended in him taking his own life. Just a mere 10 seconds later, the whole ordeal was over, and Ryuichi collapsed to the floor. Within half a minute, Ryuichi had caused a severe amount of physical damage to a total of 19 people. This included two adults and 17 children. By the time emergency services arrived, two of those had sadly passed away, this including a 39-year-old man and a 6th grade student. Due to the large number of victims, a total of 11 ambulances were called to the scene, where 4 people were considered to be in critical condition, this including Ryuichi. Now, thankfully, all three of those innocent victims would recover from their injuries, whereas Ryuichi himself would pass away from his own self-inflicted stab wounds. After searching around the crime scene, officers found 4 knives on his body, this including 2 fishing knives and 2 knives in his backpack, one of which being more than 25 centimeters long. A second backpack containing a sashimi knife was found at a local convenience store, therefore indicating that Ryuichi planned to return and cause further bloodshed. It was further learned that most of these knives were purchased several months prior, therefore suggesting that he'd planned these attacks for quite some time. However, despite all of the evidence available, we will likely never know the real motive behind Ryuichi's actions. We can only assume that the man was so depressed and helpless that he came to the conclusion that he no longer wanted to exist. And with so much angst and hate towards the world, he planned to depart it with the most inflicted devastation possible. It is often noted that people who commit these mass public atrocities do not intend to come out of it alive. Japan has unfortunately seen a number of these mass killings in recent years. Some of you will remember that I've covered a few already, including the Kyoto Anime Massacre. These people feel that they have nothing left to lose, yet all the same harbour such a high degree of hate towards the world that they feel the need to punish all of those around them. Take Elliot Roger for example. The young man knew that he wanted to end his own life. He never questioned his depression or his own faults. Instead, he blamed the so-called stupidity of women and frat boys, and in the end, his target was none other than a sorority house. Similarly, Elliot was a recluse set against the world, isolated from society. Isolation can simulate a severely negative toll on one's mental health, and it's obvious that this sort of problem extends past American borders and into other societies such as Japan. The post-incident response to this case is extremely telling of that. Hikikomori are so prevalent in Japan that they even have their own websites, communities, and events. And after Ryuichi's crime, the head of Hikikomori UX conference released a statement to say that this crime should not be linked to their lifestyle, and that they should not all be thought of as potential criminals. However, this would not stop the Japanese media from sensationalizing the situation as such. So much so that those living with current shut-ins began to feel fear that their reclusive friends and loved ones would be the next to commit such heinous crimes. In the days and weeks after his actions, the whole country was in shock, and the face of Ryuichi Ichi spread quickly throughout the media, alongside the newly tainted reputation of those within the Hikikomori community. And one person to hear the news was 76-year-old Hideaki Kumazawa, who just so happened to be the former Vice Minister for Agriculture, Forestry and Fisheries. The details about the news reminded him of his own son, who was 44-year-old Iachiro. Unfortunately, he had recently moved back in with his parents, due to his repeated failure in finding a job. While growing up, Ichiro was considered to be gifted in elementary school. He was placed in private education by his resoundingly successful father, but after moving into junior high, his grades would suddenly begin to disappoint. Most notably, he didn't quite meet his mother's expectations, who unfortunately was particularly strict with her son throughout his childhood. If he didn't achieve the grades that she desired, she would take away his toys and belongings, even sometimes destroying them right in front of his eyes. Now, this animosity at home was reflected in Aitro's behaviour in school. 
According to previous classmates, he was that obsessive weird kid who always spoke to himself. Apparently, he was very much the type of person to hyperfixate on things, and was very obsessed with video games and anime, often losing himself in those fictional worlds. Rather than pay attention in class, he would instead draw the characters he was obsessing over, and back at home, he would lock himself in his room and play video games all night. This continued into his adulthood, when he then grew a strong addiction to the video game Dragon Quest X. It became obvious by now that this was Aitro's preferred method of communication, connecting the other people through a keyboard and mouse rather than through real life. This sort of behaviour caused significant animosity among the family. But although Ichiro's mother could easily take control of her son as a child, he was now getting older, and therefore stronger in both physical strength and strength of mind. And after his second year of junior high, Ichiro began to intimidate and sometimes even hit her when she upset him, which, as you can imagine, caused much grief within the family. Unknown to them at the time, but Ichiro was actually actually displaying all the telltale signs of autism. However, developmental disorders are a somewhat controversial topic in Japan, and he would only be diagnosed several decades too late. This delayed diagnosis also explained his social issues, and his tendency to hyperfixate on specific things. These tendencies would also transition into his adult life. Iuchiro didn't want to follow the path of his father, no matter how much his mother tried to push him towards it. Instead, Iuchiro followed his heart and passion, and wanted to get a job in the anime and manga industry. His parents would continue to push him to go to a standard college. But after failing his entrance exams, he instead enrolled at Yoyogi Animation Academy. Graduating with a degree in computer graphics a few years later, he was thrust into the world of working, where he would sadly ultimately fail again. Unable to secure a new job, his father used used his connections to find work at a hospital, and although this would allow him to move out of the family home, the apartment he ended up living in was still owned by his mother. So, if it's not abundantly clear by now, Eiichiro unfortunately did not have the mental means to support himself, and in his adult life, he became increasingly reclusive as the years passed by. He would continue to sit indoors, watch anime, play video games, and spend way too much time online. In fact, found on his Twitter account, he even boasted that he logged into Dragon Quest Online every day since it was released, which by that time was almost seven years ago. As a result of his reclusive behaviour and mental challenges, he eventually lost his job of course, in Japan society, bringing shame and disappointment to his family. Without a job, Aitro could no longer afford to live alone, and so in May of 2019, and at the age of 44, he moved back in with his parents. His behaviour plummeted almost instantly, and it's reported that he became depressed, was embarrassed with his life, and even lashed out at his family. And naturally, both his mother and his father were rather nervous about his violent outbursts add disappointment to the mix, and it's quite obvious why they didn't really appreciate his company. Hikikomori had a bad enough reputation by now, and unfortunately, Eiichiro was beginning to fit that label perfectly. And then, only one week after moving back in with his parents, the Kawasaki stabbings occurred. Talk of Hikikomori flooded Japan's headlines, and one of those to hear of the news, of course, was Eiichiro's father, Hideaki Kumazawa. It was at that moment that Hideaki made a terribly flawed connection. The old man was beginning to see his son in Ryuichi Iwasaki. In his eyes, someone just like his own boy, had just committed terrible atrocities, all supposedly due to his anger and a lack of social interaction. Both Ryuichi and Iichiro, they were both hikikomori and both capable of violence. Aichiro himself had proven that he was capable of causing harm to other people, and Hideaki's worry and fear for his own safety would come to a peak on June the 1st, 2019. It was another average day in the Kamazawa household. Hideaki's wife was out working, while Eiichiro was in his room playing Dragon Quest Online. Meanwhile, adjacent to their home, the local school was busy hosting an athletics event, with cheering heard throughout the entire neighbourhood. The cheering seemed to bother Eiichiro, however, and with his growing irritation, his anger once again manifested itself. He began to shout at his father, starting yet another argument between the two. And during this argument, Eiichiro told his father that he wanted to kill him. As you can imagine, this was a huge red flag for Hideaki, as just three days prior, 19 people had been severely injured by Ryuichi Iwasaki, and now here was his son threatening him with his own life. 
With the fearful imagery still branded fresh into his mind, Hideaki made a snap decision during his son's outburst. The old man was going to make sure that his son would never become a mass murderer like Ryuichi. And with Ichiru's anger still erupting, Hideaki made his way to the kitchen, grabbed a knife, and then began to savagely attack his own son, tragically stabbing him repeatedly in the neck and chest. It wasn't until 30 stab wounds later that Hideaki finally seized his attack, walking away and leaving his son to bleed to death on the kitchen floor. It seemed that Hideaki wanted to take accountability for his brutal actions, because at 3.30pm that same afternoon, he dialed the number for the Japanese emergency services to report the murder of his son by his own hand. Paramedics rushed the family home, but sadly, by the time they arrived it was all too late. He had bled out long before he could receive help and was therefore pronounced dead at the scene. Moving to the legal proceedings of this case, but Hideaki would never take any accountability for his actions. Instead, he would even try to justify them by saying that his son had attacked him during an argument. To make things worse, he even claimed it was for the greater good, as he didn't want his son to become the next murderous Ikikomori. But by the time his second trial came around, Hideaki seemed to have a change of heart, because now he only claimed self-defense. This didn't hold water in court however, as there was no evidence or proof to suggest that Hideaki had struggled or even been physically hurt during the attack. More damning though was the evidence of premeditation to Hideaki's onslaught on his own son. Search histories found on his computer showed that he had been heavily researching the legal repercussions of killing someone in Japan, and also how best to get these charges and sentences deferred or minimized. To really cement his guilt, a letter was found addressed from Hideaki to his wife, stating that his son was beyond all help and the world would be a better place if he were to simply disappear. Faced with the overwhelming evidence, Hideaki stressed that, despite the premeditation, he was extremely remorseful for what he had done to his son, and that he felt that, at the time, he had no other choice. Ultimately, after pleading not guilty in February of 2021 to the murder of his son, Hideaki Kamazawa was found guilty and sentenced to a meager six years in prison. Now, here on Coffee House Crime, we've seen some ridiculously short sentences before, but six years for murdering your own son, it honestly leaves me feeling pretty dumbfounded, especially considering the sheer violence showed during the attack. In his mind, Hideaki was convinced with such complete certainty that his son was both capable and able to commit the same level of atrocities as Ryuichi. So much so that it gave him every bit of internal validation and justification to stab him to death in his own home. This was all ultimately based on the flimsy connection of his son being a reclusive shut-in like Ryuichi was, despite other similarities being noticeably absent. There is also the possibility that Hideaki believed he was enacting a noble deed by ridding the world and his family of his problematic son, removing his burdensome existence from their lives. This was never stated by Hideaki, of course, and he likely parroted what his lawyers instructed him to say in court to give him the best chance of a short sentence. Given how successful and senior his position was within the government, there is a distinct possibility that Hideaki felt a sense of shame at Ichiro's perceived lack of any notable success. But for a sentence that short, in my eyes, nothing can really justify it, especially not for the murder of your own son. In the aftermath of the trial, the media didn't take long to link the two cases together, and ran with their new hot topic of recluses and their mental states becoming increasingly unstable as they aged. And given that Hikikomori numbers are only rising as time goes on, the media claimed that soon they will become a genuine danger to society. Shockingly, a vast number of people interviewed after the trial of Hideaki Kumazawa wholeheartedly supported his actions, indicating just how despised and shunned Hikikomori are in Japanese society. By the way, this runs in tandem with Japan's very awful views of disabled people. However, there was a small ray of hope following these two cases because after they became widely publicized, there was a substantial increase in people seeking help for themselves or for their loved ones to overcome chronic reclusion and isolation. The Minister for Health in Japan also released a statement, reassuring the population that these events should not be linked inherently with hikikomori. The main point they made is that every individual is different and experiencing different life circumstances. Now, this sentiment is particularly true. Although a small number of folks are shut-ins and choose to sit in their own world of hate, most people People simply prefer their own space and privacy. There can be a lot of comfort in being surrounded by your own safe space, 
and if a person finds this comfortable, they should be allowed to live like this if they choose to. Eiichiro may have not been happy with his life, but it was pretty obvious that his mental health was under the influence of far more than just being a reclusive individual. And despite being reclusive to the physical world, his virtual friends in the Dragon Quest Online community made the effort of holding a virtual funeral for him. On his final Twitter post, comments can be seen split from both sides. Some agreed fully with Hideaki's actions, saying that he was fully in the right to have killed his son, and being Hikikomori was justification enough for his father's snap. But on the other side of things, several commentators sent prayers and wishes to Eichiro, offering their condolences and even hoping that in the next life, he would be allowed to be a part of the fictional world that he loved and adored so much. On May the 28th, 2019, Ryuichi's actions initially caused the death of two innocent individuals. But when you look at the case of Iichiro, it could be argued that Ryuichi actually had three innocent victims. It may very well be that, had the events of May not taken place, Hideaki may never have felt the need to reach for the knife. We will likely never fully understand the reasoning and thought process behind his attack on his son, but no matter how you look at it, nothing can ever justify such a senselessly brutal act. Given his ASD diagnosis, Eiichiro desperately needed the support early in his life to give him the maximum chance of success. However, in lieu of this, he found his comfort and solace with physical isolation, fulfilling his hyperfixations in the virtual worlds of video games and anime. Heart-wrenchingly, given the type of life that he led, there aren't a vast number of people around who feel the impact of the loss of Eiichiro. But given his online presence, and the love shown towards him after his death on Twitter, there are at least some who will miss him and will remember him fondly. To me, it is kind of wild to think that one entirely separate case of murder could then go on to influence another just several days later. As you are likely aware, the unique edge to this story is that one murder case could then go on to influence an entirely separate one. But I think one other thing that we have to address here is Aichiro's mental health, because unfortunately, he was murdered due to a lack of understanding by his family. And sadly, mental health conditions are often overlooked in Japan. Anyway folks, I'm going to wrap this case up here. Thank you so much for watching another video today by Coffeehouse Crime. If you found this story interesting or you learned something new, please remember to like the video and subscribe if you haven't yet. Thank you to Incogni for sponsoring today's video. If you'd like to get 60% off a subscription, please click the link down below. Thank you again folks, and as always, I'll be back again very soon for another video. Until that moment arrives though, remember to look after yourself, look after each other, and of course, stay safe. Thank you, and goodbye.